All right. Hey, good evening, everybody. It is fantastic to have you here tonight. My name is Tim Gells, and I'm the Education Director with the Land Trust of North Alabama. And I am a member of the Land Trust of North Alabama. And I know I'm sitting in a room with several other people who are members of the Land Trust of North Alabama. And I want to say thank you for that. I thank you for your support. I thank you for what you're doing on behalf of our community, our green spaces, and this top 10 counties of the state, as we like to say. Um, tonight, we have got Sarah Johnson. Um, just going to give just a really short introduction. So I've been in the Huntsville area for about 22 years. Now, this isn't about me, but there is a point here, okay? <laughs> so I've been in the Huntsville area for about 22 years, and I've been involved with environmental education, conservation education, for about the last 16 years. And over that time, you might be in a similar situation where over the last 16 years, you've heard certain names repeated. Oh, this person did this. This person's involved with that. Oh, I saw this person's presentation. I went on a hike with this person. And you hear these names of people who are involved with conservation education or just conservation here in this area. And it wasn't but about a year ago that I started hearing the name Sarah Johnson. I'm like, okay, that's not, that's not this woman. Who is this person? <laughs> the name started to come up more and more and more and more. Now, the whole point of Sarah's talk is that she hasn't been in this area very long, a little over a year, and yet she's already made quite an impact on the conservation efforts here in this area, made quite an impact in the educational efforts as far as conservation is concerned here in this area. So I want to thank her tonight as well for her, her being here with us. I very much so am looking forward to hearing what she has to say. So, all right, you ready? Can I say anything more? Is there anything else? No, that's all perfect. Right. I mean. Um, I want to first say welcome, thank you for coming to this talk. Anyone who registered for the talk before and had to reschedule to come again, thank you very much for coming back. Um, I see a lot of familiar faces. People have come to workshops or some of my friends and colleagues, but also a lot of new people too, so it's really nice to meet all of you. Um, this is going to be very casual, at least I hope it's going to be. I was describing it earlier as when you get back from a vacation and you force your family to look through slideshows, um, all of the photos that you took along the way, and they're like, where's all the photos of you? And you're like, there aren't any. It's just plants and animals, you know? So that's kind of going to be the vibe tonight. So if you have questions, um, obviously relevant, important questions, just raise your hand during the talk, and we can address some of them in the moment. So we're going to cover a lot of ground. We're going to cover a literal year in Alabama's natural areas, or at least some of the experiences that we have since we've been here. Um, I did shamelessly put a card on everyone's chair. Um, it has this information on there, which is mainly why I, I put it out. Um, the only one that's not on there is my iNaturalist account, so if you want to see even more plants uh, that I don't share in my presentation tonight, you can check out my iNaturalist. I update Instagram most regularly, but my website has some cool information too. So, um, first off, I am new to the area, but I grew up in western New York, in Buffalo, New York, what I call the land of ice and snow. Couldn't be much different from Alabama, and uh, I spent a lot of my time in the city where I grew up, but what I really looked forward to growing up was going to my grandparents' house. They had a forest, as I called it, which was actually just 10 acres of woods next to an agricultural property, but to me it felt really much like somewhere I could put mud on my face and roll logs and shoot bows and arrows and do all sorts of crazy stuff that I couldn't do back in the city. And so that kind of helped form um, the basis of my interest in nature. And like most people who grow up somewhere, they don't really get to know the place that they live that well, right? So when you live somewhere, you get used to it. It's not novel, it's not exciting, it's not new. And 
Um, fortunately, I met someone who was equally into nature as I am, so we did a lot of exploring, but um, these are a few pictures of the types of nature in my hometown of Buffalo. We have Lake Erie, beautiful uh, shale creek beds, um, cove-type forests, big ravines, um, beautiful, beautiful place. This is the Knife Edge in Zor Valley, one of my favorite places to hike. <clears throat> but really, I didn't know that much about it. And when I started college, I started out as a pre-med student. Anyone who tells you you want to be in science, you got to go into medicine. How else are you going to make a career in science? Mm -hmm. And so I did pre-med, I really enjoyed my classes, but in my junior year of college, I took a field ecology course. I think it was only about three weeks, and it totally changed my worldview. I had no idea that you could actually be paid to do work outside. I was like, wait a second, I can like hike and see plants and get paid for it? They didn't tell you don't get paid lunch. Like, you know, you didn't get paid for it. Huh? So anyways, this trip was just phenomenal um, in terms of scenic vistas, but also we were working on a long-term study of regeneration of alpine plants after trampling or after a burn. And so it was a really cool first experience in the world of field ecology. I had no idea this existed. So as you can imagine, um, I had no idea what to do. I was in my senior year and I was like, wait a second, I don't want to be a doctor. I don't think I ever wanted to be a doctor. What am I doing with my life? Um, so I took two years. I worked in AmeriCorps doing environmental education, um, doing a lot of tours, really learning about the natural areas around me in New York. And um, over time, again, I met my partner who's really into nature too. We did a lot of exploring and traveling. There's some photos from Mount Hood, from Arizona. Um, and then I had a lot of odd jobs in the interim. I worked as a florist, a dog groomer, uh, a barista. I even worked in a library for a little while. I did a lot of different jobs. And I thought, you know, I think I want to figure out what skills I'm missing so I can maybe go back to grad school. And it seemed like I really needed some of these field skills. So I got some seasonal work, um, some doing bat, uh, bird banding in North Carolina. So that was my first experience with bird banding. That's a very sweet Canada warbler, which is one of our target species. Um, it was one of the hardest things I'd ever done. It was my first experience in field work, and it was tough. I cried a lot. I think I slept like four hours a night quite, quite often, um, but it was fantastic at the same time. Um, in Illinois, uh, we moved to Illinois to do our secondary degrees. I also did some field work there, working as a uh, survey uh, assistant for bat work, so I did some mist netting. Um, basically, long story short, I, I tried a lot of different things <laughs> to get to where I am today, and um, it really led to you know getting a more broad experience in nature instead of specializing. Um, but then I thought, well, maybe I do want to specialize a little bit. I think I have a lot of interests, so what do I want to do? Um, started my master's in 2018 at the University of Illinois and got to know grassland and prairie ecosystems. I even got to help on a burn, um, which was awesome. <laughs> um, I did a couple of those. And then um, my master's work took me to the panhandle of Florida. So I'd been through Alabama many times. I had driven through that 13-hour drive over and over and over again, back and forth to the panhandle of Florida. But I never really stopped in Alabama. I did stop at Peach Park in Dothan yeah. <laughs> to get the peach ice cream. <laughs> But other than that, I hadn't really spent a lot of time in the state. So um, the work in the panhandle is fantastic. Um, I specifically work with rare and endangered plant species. So this plant is Macridia alba. That was my study species for my master's. I have to see a lot of other cool plants. And now this has led me to finish my master's. And I currently still work with the University of Illinois as a plant ecologist in August. So um, this picture on the left is some of my most recent work in Texas. We work with a rare bladder pod and some other species there too. So um, that brings us to Alabama. <laughs> we moved to Alabama September 2021. And this is the first picture I took. <laughs> uh, I was very excited to see that the mascot for the baseball team in town was a raccoon. Most importantly, a trash panda. And um, I felt, you know, I think this place is for me. I think I'm going to like it here. And uh, ever since then, we've just been exploring and finding new places and really trying to get stuck in and learn about the rich culture and natural history of Alabama. So, 
I do also feel the need to immediately say that I am obviously not an expert, especially on Alabama geology, <coughs> history, culture, flora, any of the above. But I'm very interested in it, so I think that's one important point, that you can learn a lot just if you're really excited about something. Um, and fortunately in Alabama, there's a lot of great things to explore. This picture is um, of the physiographic regions for some of the natural divisions of the state, where you see where upland regions and the mountainous regions kind of blend or meet um, down to the coastal plain area. And the variation in these types of habitats, the geology, the elevation, um, this is all what makes Alabama really unique and importantly really biodiverse. Alabama has over 6,350 species, um, not just plants, animals, snails, clams, whatever, they, you know, all sorts of wildlife um, are included in that species list. It's ranked fourth in biodiversity, and Alabama's plant biodiversity has grown by 150 newly described plant species just in the last decade. So there's always something to be explored. I think we often live in a time where we think we've kind of done it all, right? Like we've figured it all out, and that is absolutely not true. There's new things being discovered all the time. Um, there are some books that will help you, oh, so here's where we are, by the way. <laughs> We're right between the Cumberland Plateau and the Highland Rim area. So Cumberland Plateau is, of course, this uh, lower um, rolling mountainous area, and the Highland Rim, which flattens out to more glade-type ecosystems. But there's also some books that you can read, um, many of which I have found here at the library. And I have not read them cover to cover, but they're all fantastic. Um, these will all help you get some information about the region. Um, I, I really like Southern Wonder and the Lost Worlds in Alabama Rocks book is very cool as well. Um, so most of this presentation is going to cover the natural areas within the northern portion of the state, mostly the northeastern portion where we are, but um, generally, I'm not doing very good at this point, but generally this area, um, there will be some spots that are either in Tennessee or Georgia right around the corner. So. We are going to take a year journey through um, Alabama. I do have to say I couldn't bring it to the present date. I brought it to September of this year because I simply would have run out of time. I Paring down the photos for this presentation was extremely challenging for me. I would say on average, on an average hike, I'd probably take anywhere from 50 to 100 photos. So if you add that up over every hike over the year, it's a lot. So um, I had to trim it down a little bit, but hopefully it's a good representation of different types of habitats in Alabama. So I thought September 1st, when we moved here, September 1st, 2021, would be a nice place to start. Um, as I mentioned before, being a plant nerd, I, a lot of these pictures are going to be of plants. Uh, there's also a great thing about plants in that they don't move, so they're pretty easy to photograph. <laughs> Anytime I try to get a picture of sneak up on a butterfly, they fly away. Mm -hmm. um, birds, my camera just can't do that, right? So there's a lot of pictures of plants, but hopefully we make it fun. Um, so when we moved here September 1st, I don't know if you guys remember last September, but you had a lot of rain. <laughs> um, you had two full days of rain, in fact, that just totally downpoured on the area right before we moved here. So it was really fun to get here in the evening, unload some parts of our truck in the pouring rain, and then wake up the next morning and experience some of the most intense humidity I've ever felt in my life uh, that I was kind of prepared for, but not totally prepared for. Um, I remember just being absolutely slicked with moisture, like on my arms, and not being able to carry anything. It was very dangerous, actually. But anyways, we um, had all this rain, it was very humid, and we had a couple of days off before I had to go to work, so we figured, let's find a place to hike. So one of the first places we went to is Goldsmith Schiffman Wildlife Sanctuary, which is very close to where we live, it's very accessible, it's a city-owned park or preserve. And uh, I really like this spot because coming from Illinois, we didn't have a lot of uh, river-type ecosystems. We had some floodplain habitat, but um, this spot is very cool because it's got the floodplain areas, the creek, it's got a grass and prairie habitat, and it's also got a really nice pond where you can see a lot of waterfowl, turtles, all sorts of things. Um, so that was one of our first hikes, but another hike that we did um, soon after was at Monsanto and the Monsanto Preserve, a land trust property, of course. Um, 
And coming from the Grand Prairie of Illinois, seeing a little pocket of grassland on one of our first hikes was really nice. Uh, this area on the left here is one of those power line right of ways that you see at uh, Montesano State Park. This power line right of way uh, basically traverses through, I believe it, the same one traverses through Wade Mountain as well. So you can see this um, kind of strip of grassland, and it's so starkly different from the neighboring um, forest next door. So what's really neat about um, this area is, I think we think of it as being really high in tree diversity, which is very true, but this area also used to historically have a lot of grassland habitat. And this is kind of the way that we're seeing them persisting now, is in these disturbed areas that are maintained on purpose to stay as grassland instead of being encroached by trees or shrubs or invasive species, they're actually managed so that things don't grow very tall. So we get these little mosaic habitats of grassland. And what you would have historically seen is that patchwork ecosystem of some forested areas, but then a place where there's maybe very shallow soil and not a lot of trees can grow. So you get these grassland related type habitats. And two of the plants that you'll see in these types of habitat are downy lobelia, lobelia, lobelia puberola, um, the showiest, colorful of the, of the lobelias, except for, of course, cardinal flower. And um, I guess there's a couple other showier ones, but um, this is a really particularly special one. Nice bright purple blues. And then a flowering spurge, Euphorbia corolata. Uh, if you look closely, you can see our little jumping spider friend who was <laughs> Uh, suspicious of me, for sure. <laughs> I would like to turn off my, there we go, my pointer here. I'm just grabbing the shift. Mm -hmm. oh, sorry guys, what did I do? <laughs> it's off. <laughs> no! Okay. Well, I'll just have to use my... Sorry guys, give me one sec. Something happened and my mouse isn't currently working. Or my my right pointer. So. Huh? No, my my um pointer isn't working, you guys. Let me try that. It doesn't look like she can move it along because she said the person. Oh, now that's a good sign, maybe. <clears throat> no, I'm not seeing anything on the. Uh... We are taking a brief pause <laughs> to do some troubleshooting here. Do the left and right. There you go. Okay, all right, okay. All right, we're good. We're back in business, people. <laughs> I'm trying to I'm trying to turn off the uh, pointer there that I got because it's not letting me uh, click through. All right, crisis averted. We're back on track. <laughs> Thank you for your patience. Um, all right, so everybody can see this tiny buddy, right? Okay, this adorable little fence lizard, eastern fence lizard. They're kind of a common lizard. They live in a variety of habitats, woodlands, grasslands, but they really like these rocky outcrop areas because they can hide really quickly from predators, but they can also bask in the sunlight, warm themselves up on the rocks. And so this was a fun thing to see when we were out on that rock um, grassland area at Montesano. I like that spot because it's actually got a lot of species in a very small area. It's a very cool spot. Um, these eastern fence lizards, if you flip them over on their side, which I don't recommend doing, they don't like it, they probably won't let you, but they do have a blue underbelly that when they are trying to defend their territory against other males or um, show off to females maybe, they can flip up their, their belly and show how blue their tummy is. <laughs> and that just makes them even more precious to me. Uh, one of the shrubs I looked forward to seeing the most moving here, again, as Alabamians, you might find this to be a regular old shrub that you find all over the place. But man, what a beauty. Calicarpa means beautiful fruit in Greek. Uh, I think it is correct. <laughs> this bright purple is just something you don't see very often. It is in the mint family, which I find very interesting. It's hard to tell from looking at it like this, but maybe a little reminiscent when you see the flowers. Um, but the purple fruits are just loved by wildlife, by birds. Um, 
pretty easy to grow, I've heard, so hopefully I can grow this one in the future. Um, this one I thought was interesting because I don't know if it experienced some maybe like herbicide drift or something, or if it's just a, a mosaic virus, but it had this crazy patterning on the foliage with the yellowish color. Usually that means that it's got some sort of virus, but um, didn't seem to be hurting at all. I mean, the plant is massive, so it was um, exceptionally nice to see. And at the end of the hike, maybe you go up to Blevins Gap, you grab an ice cream at Brewster's, and you sit and watch the sunset. Uh, again, as people with mountains around you at all times, large hills, uh, <laughs> this was a big deal for us flat riders uh, to see this vista and, and really just, I just fell in love with the, with the area. Um, so yeah, I really love this spot to see sunsets. I know there's a lot of great programs that happen up at Blevins, um, but this was a very nice view. There's a cool plant that grows up there along the disturbed um, roadsides called prairie tea, Croton monanthogynus. Um, it's in the Euphorbiaceae family, so some of you may actually grow some Euphorbias in your house as houseplants. This guy looks totally different, um, but it's got this pubescent, kind of dusty look of the leaves and that gorgeous, rusty color of the stems. I really love the way it looks, especially sunset in the background. But one of the coolest things I learned about it is it does grow on these limestone and cedar glades um, most frequently, but it also feeds the larva of the goatweed leafwing butterfly. So even though it's probably considered kind of a weedy plant species, it feeds this beautiful thing. So if you ever see this butterfly flying around, you can thank the prairie tea. So some honorable mentions of some places that we went to that didn't make the cut. As you can see, there's no way I could fit this all into this presentation. Uh, nice hike at Goldsmith Schiffman, um, some Agalinus, Fox Club at Wade Mountain, Montesano, um, that's Doll's Eyes, Actia, you can see the creepy, creepy eyes of the fruits. Hayes Nature Preserve has a great boardwalk where you can see the Tupelo swamps. Um, first thing I did here was buy a canoe. I didn't have a reason for a canoe in Illinois, so I bought one immediately and took it out on the Tennessee River, some hikes at Hill Mountain and Columbus Gap as well. So we get to October. Um, it was kind of a busy month, but uh, we were surprised how warm it still was and thought we'd go out for a little bit of a longer hike. And again, being from the Grand Prairie region, seeking out a grassland seemed like a nice little comfort zone for us. So the forest is generally slowed down this time of year. There's not a lot going on, not a lot blooming, um, other than, of course, the trees changing colors. And so we thought, well, let's try to find a grassland. There's lots of flowers and insects in grasslands this time of year. So we headed to Prairie Grove Glades Preserve. With a raise of hand, how many people have been out to Prairie Glades Grove? <coughs> Whoa! Oh, this is so exciting. This is my, this is what I live for. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so Prairie Glades Grove is um, a cedar and limestone glade um, in the Moulton Valley region, which, if you remember our map from earlier, is in the Highland Rim area. This area, right down on the bottom, is what's called the Moulton Valley area. And again, this area has a really diverse uh, geology, and this is uh, a graphic I found. I'm going to do my best to explain some of it, but the area has the second oldest surface rocks in the state, next to the valley and ridge region of the southern Appalachian uh, area. So these rocks date over 250 million years old. And like a lot of the rocks in this area, there's a lot of uh, fossilized sea creatures dating back to when there was a shallow ocean over this region. And so, I, again, I don't, I don't want to mess with my pointer because I don't want to mess it up, but you can see how there's kind of this um, angled geology and that kind of helps with creating those little microhabitats where soil either does or does not uh, accumulate, which creates that, again, that mosaic of forest and prairie ecosystems. And because of that ecology and geology, there's a lot of endemic plants in the area. These, these aren't specifically endemic plants, but endemic plants meaning they don't really exist anywhere else in the world. Sometimes plants can be endemic to countries, continents, uh, states or even counties. So, for example, the plant I studied for my master's is endemic to only four counties in the entire world. So, endemism is very cool, and they're endemic because they're very specialized to whatever their habitat is. 
Um, this site in particular has over 34 species of aster just native to that area. Uh, one being sneezeweed. I, I just named it as helenium because there's a few heleniums at that site, and I gotta be honest, I don't know which one it is. But um, we saw some nice pollinators um, on some different types of asters while we were out there, and uh, a lot of persimmons, which is kind of a prairie shrub tree. They exist a lot on the margins between woodlands and grassland areas. And if you look closely, right under that leaf, you can see a pumpkin orb weaver pretending it's a bright persimmon. <laughs> it's trying to blend in. Um, but ripe persimmons are great, unripe persimmons, not so much. Yeah. <laughs> um, another cool plant that was new to me, I'd seen it in leafy form in the panhandle, but never in flower. This is dog fennel, Eupatorium pilifolium. Um, anyone want to guess what it's? It's an aster, I guess. Maybe people know Eupatoriums are Joe Pye weeds, um, kind of a more common garden species. But this plant has so many flowers on each plume, so it's super attractive to butterflies and bees and other types of pollinators. So apparently all parts of this, the plant have like a carroty or fennel scent, which is why it's called dog fennel, but it is super toxic. So just because it smells like fennel doesn't mean it tastes like fennel. So keep that in mind if you ever see it. But um, they get pretty tall, they get almost this big, so um, it was a neat find. And this beauty is a native orchid species, uh, ladies tresses. And this orchid blooms in the fall, unlike some of our other native orchids that bloom in the spring or the summer. And I thought it might be Cernua, but just to give you an idea of how challenging it can be to differentiate, uh, there are 14 species of spiranthes in the state. So they all look basically like this, with small variations in the flower. If you're bold enough to get down on your hands and knees, you can take a whiff of the flowers, and some of them are really strongly scented, which is in part of their, some of the species' names. Um, so they're, they're really beautiful, but they only get about six inches tall, so sometimes they can blend into the, grass, the grasses pretty well and can be hard to find. But like a lot of terrestrial orchid species, um, they do depend on a symbiotic relationship with mycorrhizal fungi that live in the soil. So um, that fungi helps them uptake nutrients, it helps seed reproduce successfully, and it's also why they're kind of threatened because these types of plants are often subject to poaching, right? Orchids are beautiful, people see them, they want them in their gardens, and then they wonder why they don't live when they transplant them. And that's part of the reason is that that close, close relationship with those soils and that tie into that environment is very important for them. Um, but they are bumblebee pollinated. Um, sometimes sweat bees or smaller bees will be seen on there. Um, actually, Matt has a cool video of one grabbing a, inside of a flower getting pollinia or a pollen sac stuck to its base, which is pretty neat. Um, and these are within Madison County as well, even though these were taken outside of Madison County. So some honorable mentions for October. Over. Um, some great hikes at Montesano. Again, um, up in the top, you'll see these fantastic pink ghost pipes that I saw at Wade Mountain. Usually, they're this, they're called ghost pipes, they're a ghostly white color, but these were this phenomenal pink. That was a very cool find. Um, Green Mountain, and then we actually ventured all the way up to Tennessee to go to the Walls of Jericho. Um, when I say all the way up, that's a joke, it's not that far, actually. <laughs> I was very surprised, it was very close. Um, but this is another orchid species. Scudera pubescens, which is the rattlesnake plantain. It's not in bloom, but the leaves are just incredible. Question? Yes. What causes the, um, the uh, Indian pipe? Isn't that what it's called? Yep. Yeah. What causes that to be the pink color? I've never seen that. Before. I tried to get some information about it. I don't think it's really deep. They, the certain populations, because they don't disperse very far, uh, Produce, they don't produce photosynthetic pigments, but they do produce other non photosynthetic pigments, so those are just full of. Uh, and the the so just certain populations will just express that gene and have a ton of it. Yeah. Will there, will they, will there, are there populations that are other colors as well? You'll have ones that are mostly white. You'll have some that have more striations almost on them, but uh, they're yeah. predominantly cool. white. Yeah. Okay. yeah, there's another species too called pine sap, which is a more southern plant in the genus, I believe, um, that's like an orangish, yellowish color, but it always, as far as I know, always kind of looks like that color as opposed to fluctuating between the two. I haven't seen pine sap down here yet, but I've seen it in Appalachia. 
Um, November, bringing us to present day, but a year ago. Uh, <laughs> this is at Green Mountain. We had some friends coming through on their way to Florida to visit family for Thanksgiving, and we wanted to show off the beautiful fall color. And so we took them to Green Mountain, and man, I just feel like, yeah, this is when fall's really happening, which again, is a surprise to me because I, I'm on the phone with my dad in New York, and he's like, yeah, we're getting a frost, we're gonna get snow maybe on Saturday. And you're like, oh my God. I'm so lucky, I feel like I completely forgot what it's like to be in fear of snow all the time. <laughs> so, um, but my favorite thing that we did uh, in November was to take a very chilly, it must have been one of the colder days, not the warmer days in November, uh, we went out paddling out in the marshy wetlands at the Wheeler National Wildlife Refuge. And these pond areas are pretty calm, stable water levels. Um, there's lots of great views of the trees, but you also get a lot of vegetation. So it's a great place to go if you want to see some waterfowl or some shorebirds um, and other animals because it's very quiet. And uh, as you can see, nobody else was. I actually remember meeting two hike, uh, hunters on our way back out, and they're like, "It's cold. Why are you doing this? It's wet out there. What are you guys doing?" And I'm like, "Yeah, it's fine." Um, but yeah, this increased vegetation is really good for nesting waterfowl. So the fact that these areas aren't used by motor boats or other types of boats is really important. So a neat feature of these wetlands are these vegetation mats that are kind of like floating mats. Um, you'll see in the back there's a lot of lilies. These are native lilies. Um, as far as I know, I think they're nufar, which is a type of native water lily. But um, these, there's all those, also these floating mats of sedges, um, there's Ludwigias, there's asters, like um, maybe a Coryopsis or something similar in the middle. And because these form these kind of dense mats of vegetation, they're almost like a landform. So they're great places for birds to nest because it's a place where predators most likely aren't going to be able to walk out to them and eat their eggs. Um, they can be mostly undisturbed. And of course, it's a great place for frogs and other animals to lay their eggs too. I don't know what kind of egg this is. I'm not up on my bird egg ID, although I know there's someone out there who is probably, but I'm gonna guess it's a, a duck or some sort of other shorebird. We did see gadwalls and teals while we were out there and some other shorebirds, but I'm bad at shorebirds, so <laughs> can't tell you what they were, but it's such a beautiful place. But by far, the most exciting find is another species of orchid, a native orchid, and I had no idea we were going to see this when we went out there. It was a complete surprise to me because I'd never actually um, seen this species in the wild before. So we were trying to get closer to these floating mats, but we couldn't really get close to them because we're on a canoe, right? So um, we get up a little bit closer and I realize that it's an orchid, and I'm just in complete shock. This is the water spider orchid. And they can grow in wet areas on land, but mostly they grow in these floating mats. Um, they really like their feet wet. So they're mostly a southeastern species, but they do get northmost in range to the Carolinas. And um, if you can, um, again, I'm not going to do my pointer, but on the back of the flowers, you can see that there's a long nectar spur. And kind of you can see here on the back of the flowers, those nectar spurs are nice and long and have nectar down at the base and also smell like vanilla at night so they likely attract nocturnal pollinators like moths and whatever moth pollinates them must have a proboscis or a, a, a straw-like appendage that can reach down into that nectar tube to reach that nectar and by doing that they hit their head on the top of the flower they get covered in pollen and then they take that pollen to other plants and that's how this plant is pollinated so you might know about ghost, or ghost orchids and the Everglades. Um, these moths that pollinate them have a very specialized long proboscis that um, can reach way down into the bottom of that nectar tube. Because if you have um, you know, a different size, you may not be attracted to that flower because you're not going to get any nectar from it. So why bother visiting it if you're not going to get any resources from it? So um, I just thought this was a very cool find um, that I did not expect. And of course, they're very vulnerable. Um, one of the reasons they're not very common is there isn't a lot of intact wetland like this. It's usually drained for agriculture or it's um, maybe dammed so that it can be used for a lake or something similar. You don't have a lot of uh, vegetation in areas that people recreate in. So having these preserved areas is really important. 
Um, honorable mentions for November, uh, Blevins Gap, this is Sugar Tree Trail. I remember it specifically because that golden hue was just everywhere with all the leaves changing. Another trip at Goldsmith Schiffman and our friends uh, enjoyed their hike with us at Green Mountain. We went for the first time to Montesano State Park and saw Japan House and Gardens, which I really enjoyed. And another trip up to Tennessee. We went to a fantastic spot called Foster Falls Recreation Area. There's a really big waterfall. It's huge for climbers because there's a, a really long, wide rock face that's great for climbing. So if you're a climbing enthusiast, that's a place that you may or may not have been before. We didn't realize that. We took a trail that we thought was a normal trail, and it was the climber trail. So, you know, we're walking along, and then we're like, oh, excuse me, sorry. Uh, didn't mean to get in your way, but it was a really wonderful hike. Made it to December. Uh, this is at Blevins Gap. Uh, we took my parents on a hike there when they came to visit, and wow, what a flex to bring your parents to town and they were wearing a t-shirt on your hike <laughs> in December. <laughs> Woo, that felt really cool. I really enjoyed it. <laughs> um, but that was just a really nice experience to bring them to town and show them around, and uh, I just thought this photo was really beautiful, so I added it here. But uh, we also went to Wheeler National Wildlife Refuge to go see the sandhill cranes. When we lived in Illinois, we would go over the border into Indiana where they would come in in hundreds of thousands in the evening to roost. Um, and it was just one little patch of area that they would come to every night. And so it was really fun to think about the fact that maybe these are some of the birds that we'd seen in Illinois before, but now they overwinter here in Alabama. I did get some up-close shots through my binoculars. They're generally calm animals, but every once in a while it's some close quarters and they get into some spats and arguments. But on the right you can see the sandhill crane, it has the reddish part on its face, its color is kind of grayish brownish. Um, every once in a while you will see a whooping crane in, in and amongst these flocks. Um, but I did, hopefully you guys can hear this, but I took a short video through the window of the nature center. It's kind of hard to hear, but they really sound like dinosaurs, you know? Like they, they kind of look like dinosaurs, they kind of sound like dinosaurs, and if I was up close to one, I would definitely be a pretty scared of them, because they're basically as tall as me. Um, but what I think is cool is that a lot of them have lived maybe up to 25 years, which is their lifespan, so they've probably traveled this route many, many, many times, and they come here to overwinter most years, most likely. Um, we were fortunate to see a couple of whooping cranes. Uh, I think this picture shows them a little more obviously. You can see the black streak down their face. Um, but whooping cranes are endangered, and mostly due to drainage of these wetland areas. Like I was saying, there's not many of these intact wetlands left. And um, restoring these habitats is key to them surviving. At one point, there were only 15 whooping cranes left in the wild. And I don't know if you guys have seen Fly Away Home or some of the videos of those breeding programs where they have the mitt with the puppet and they feed the babies in the breeding program. Um, that's essentially what they did with the whooping crane. And now there's over 800 surviving birds, but I think at one point there was probably um, documented 10,000 individuals. Um, but hopefully we'll get back there someday. But yeah, they, they're in these mixed flocks with the sandal cranes. This was my favorite sign I saw at the preserve. <laughs> Less noise, more wildlife. And I just thought this was a crowd that would appreciate that. If I could get one for in front of my house when the leaf blowers go by, that would be awesome. <laughs> um, a couple really great hikes in December. It's waterfall season in December. It was very rainy. We had really good flowing waterfalls. Bethel Springs is by far one of my favorite um, land trust properties. Uh, another one, Bankhead National Forest. Great, a Russian waterfall. Um, we took a fantastic hike at Bankhead. It was very hard for me to not show those photos too, but um, Blevins Gap, and then this cold, cold little buddy in Keel Mountain. This is a Carolina anole, and he's chilling on this branch. Like I don't know what I was thinking, but I wish that I wasn't up here. <laughs> so we made it to January. I put this as the highlight for this month because it was such a thrill to have our first snow on January 1st, I believe, on New Year's Day. Um, this was what it looked like outside of our window, just all the trees dripping with this very um, intense, um, fluffy snow. 
And then I gotta admit it was kind of cool for it to just be gone. Then <laughs> <laughs> I don't have to brush out my car, I don't have to dig out my vehicle. It's easy peasy. Um, but this is just beautiful. I would like to see a little bit more snow. Um, but in January, we did something very outside of our comfort zone, which was going into a cave. Alabama is known for incredible cave diversity and just abundance. There's so many caves in this area. And fortunately, we have two friends that are experienced cavers, and they were very good at assessing our comfortability and letting us do things on our own terms. And we went to Tumbling Rock Cave. Has anyone gone in a cave before? Fantastic. Has anyone been to Tumbling Rock Cave? Okay, so Tumbling Rock Cave is um, one of the more beginner caves because only because it's horizontal and quite large inside. So there's quite a lot of room to stand. You won't bump your head as much in this cave as opposed to others. Um, but there's also a lot of really neat features: stalactites, stalagmites, crystallized forms. Um, this is. Doesn't look that big from this photo, but this is a surprisingly large rock face that you had to scramble. I hadn't anticipated how athletic you had to be to be in a cave. And also just staring into the darkness for that many hours was really taxing on um, my eyes. But as far as I remember, this cave is seven miles long underground. So you can travel seven miles uninterrupted <laughs> underground, which was the main reason I was terrified, because there's a lot of <laughs> land above you, and there's a lot of land around you, and there's only one way in and one way out. So if you can get over that fear, which I highly recommend you do, it is a fantastic experience. We saw some cool critters while we were in there, some camel crickets. Um, we have a, a nymph or a, a young salamander, probably a cave salamander. Uh, there were some areas where we could see their little footprints in the sand. Um, we did see a couple of bats. I believe these are tricolored bats, but I was trying very carefully to not get close to them. Even just a few people, too many in the cave, can raise the temperature and disturb them and actually wake them up out of their dormancy. So I didn't get too close to it, um, but I did want to document it because it's so sweet just hanging there, snoozing away. Um, another cool thing is seeing some of the fossils in the upper structure of the cave. These are crinoid fossils. Um, another example of the sea life that used to exist here at one point in time, which is hard to imagine, but there's, there's proof right there. Um, another cool picture of some of the features, you can see how much room in some of these areas we had with headspace in there, so we weren't bonking ourselves. But um, again, just a really cool experience to try to traverse and navigate through the cave. Um, it's our friend, I covered his face with a smiley face. I, I didn't ask him for permission to do this presentation, so, um, but this part of the cave was very challenging and very cool. So there's an area inside of this cave with a 400 foot tall shaft with a waterfall inside called the Topless Dome. Leave it to your imagination to know why it's called Topless. I don't know what's going on there, but hopefully it's just because it's a very tall area. <laughs> um, but there was an active waterfall flowing through it at the time we went through. So trying to get up, so this isn't the exact spot, but when you go up in, it's just water pouring out of it. So I broke my suspenders trying to get it there, but I made it. My friends helped me up into the uh, area, and this is what you find when you get in here. So I didn't take this picture. This is from Nathan Williams. This shaft is this long waterfall that just falls down and then drains out of that through the hole. So it's very cool thing to see. Definitely not what you expect to see all that way underground. And then the last thing you see on your hike is this structure called the Christmas tree. And as you can see on my face, I was very proud of myself. So I uh, was really happy to make it to that far in the cave. So some other honorable mentions. We went on a really great hike at Little River Canyon. And I actually spent most of my time in Texas for work. So there's a picture of me with a Spanish dagger that I thought I might add. Uh, in February, uh, Let's be honest, February is not the greatest month <laughs> to most people. That's why it's the shortest, right? It's pretty lean in terms of wildlife, in terms of flowers, in terms of plants. There's not too much to see. Um, but, uh, you know, despite being at this kind of like end dredges of winter, I was, of course, very pleased to see that temps were actually already rising in Alabama. Uh, this times there's still not a lot going on in the forest, so a lot of our native plants aren't really doing much in February, but um, when it comes to cultivated plants, 
there's a lot going on, so this is a great time to go to the botanical gardens, um, which I'm considering a natural area in this in this component. Um, but I mean, daffodils are blooming in February. I know, again, this seems normal to you, but it's not. It's awesome. Uh, this is paper bush, which is in the Thymolaceae family. It's native to Myanmar and China, but um, I thought the flower was just so unique. I'd never really seen anything like it. Also, some of the native and non-native magnolias are beginning to bloom. Native trees like apples, cherries, service berries, anything in that family are usually starting to bloom too. Um, camellias, of course, are still going strong, never ending, beautiful blooms. Um, this is not the native uh, witch hazel, but it also is blooming in the spring. Our native witch hazel is actually blooming right now. Um, but even trilliums, this I believe is trillium cuneatum, probably a one on steroids because it's at the garden, so it's like really happy and doing well. Um, and then our native uh, uh, Aeschylus, uh, help me out. What is it? Buckeye. Buckeye. Yes, thank you. Oh, I, I couldn't think of it. Um, those are starting to already leaf out and break buds, so things are happening in February, right? You can start to get excited about this. Um, but in the meantime, some other honorable mentions, some hikes at Montesiano for some nice lichen, mosses, waterfalls, again, great time of year to do that. We took a paddle at North Saudi Wildlife Refuge, it was nice and quiet looking for waterfowl. And just as a comparison, I did take a trip home in Buffalo in February. <laughs> This is what we're living with, people. This is what you got in Buffalo. Three solid months at least of this. Now it's beautiful, but yeah, if you're trying to get up for work in the morning, it's it's brutal, but beautiful. <laughs> okay, so we made it to March, which is the most exciting time of the year. Spring is happening, things are moving, it's greening up, the flowers are spectacular, and it's just my favorite time of year. I love spring. So that's there's a lot of a lot of photos in March and April here. Um, it was a huge shock to me coming from the north again that it was such a warm time of year. Our last frost date, I think, is like Mother's Day in New York, so this was really exciting. So I returned from a three week trip to Texas and everything was in bloom. So um, I like spring because it feels like you have to be outside all the time. There's so much new happening. Um, every week there's something new blooming. And um, this one's Fernley Phacelia, Phacelia by Pinatifida, um, which is uh, similar to Bee's Friend, which you might find in a lot of like annual seed mixes, but even better because it's a native one. Pollinators absolutely love it. Um, they're really prolific. They are annuals, I believe, so they come back every year. Um, but also just, this is at Bethel Springs, so um, kind of have the creek bed here with some smooth flocks growing along the side, and then the waterfall is going crazy, and even a little little rainbow. <laughs> also, uh, I mixed in some photos from Montesano here too because there were just some really spectacular plants that I wanted to show off from Montesano, including twin leaf, Jeffersonia diphylla. This is a more uncommon spring ephemeral, ephemeral meaning they don't last very long. And we saw a giant patch on the top of one of these mountain bluffs in Montesano, and my mind was just like, oh, I've never seen this many in one place at once, so this is really exciting. And um, this species is Myrmecocorus, which means that ants disperse their seeds. They have a fatty appendage on the outside of the seed that the ants actually want, so they take it back to their nest, they eat that fleshy appendage off of the seed, and then they toss the seeds into their trash middens, which of course is then a perfect place for this seed to germinate, because it's kind of like a compost heap. And so um, that's how these plants get around, and maybe why they're in these large patches. Um, <laughs> But a lot of uh, spring ephemerals have that dispersal technique. So, um, Rose verbene is another beautiful, new to me plant species that I hadn't really seen before. We saw it a lot in the washes and right of ways. And then um, Euphorbia mercuri mercurialina, mercury spurge, totally new plant to me. Another Euphorbia, you can tell I'm a fan. Uh, they don't really look like much most of the year, just green foliage, but their bloom is so different and unique, and I, I really, really like them. They're pretty specific to limestone and calcareous rocks, so they're mostly in this Tennessee Valley region. So they're kind of regional and special. <coughs> uh, cut leaf tooth wart, cardamony, is one of the probably more prolific spring ephemerals we have in the bowl in front of the Bethel Falls. This is everywhere in the spring. It's completely coating the rim of the bowl. And um, stone seed, it's a borage, the flowers aren't that 
dramatic, but I, can, I think they're very pretty. Um, and then also bloodroot, which I think is probably a more well-known um, cultivated spring ephemeral, but um, really beautiful plant nonetheless. <coughs> So this spot in Montesano, maybe some of you have seen, there's an incredible display of bluebells. So you walk up and you're like, wow, there's a lot of green there, and it's the only green thing really around, so you're drawn to it. You get up there and then you see all of these fantastic blooms. They're a huge hit for pollinators, and this time of year, these plants are really trying to maximize their input in putting energy down into their root system so they can basically rest for the rest of the year until next spring. So they're taking advantage of the sunlight before the canopy closes. They're taking advantage of all the early rising pollinators. Um, and they've really found their niche in um, our forests. Some other honorable mentions <laughs> for March. Uh, really great hike in the floodplain areas of Goldsmith Schiffman. Again, lots of crests and flocks and other beautiful spring ephemerals. Um, again, Montesano, which I mentioned some of, those are some anemones or hepatica on the side of a rock face. And then I spent pretty much the rest of my month in Texas for work. This is a view of the Rio Grande River from one of my field sites that I really like. April! Okay, we're, we're getting there, people. Is everyone doing okay? Yeah, we're good? Any questions? Okay. So April, again, this May... April, March is the most exciting time of year for me. So we took a trip out to Little River Canyon, hearing about how, you know, we'd been there once before, but we hadn't really been there in the spring, and we heard that it's really great for wildflowers. So we thought we'd try it out. Um, it's near Fort Payne, Alabama. How many people have been to Little River Canyon? Oh, fantastic, okay. So this is more of the so-called ridge and valley region of southern Appalachia. And it's got a lot of these deep ravines that are very wooded. You get some floodplain forest, um, or at least some riparian forest. But you also get these outcrop and glade communities, too, that I was talking about earlier. And um, there's a lot of these rocky outcrops along the roadsides. And so we pulled over to see some of these, um, wanted to try to figure out what types of plants were there. And we were really excited to see that some plants were already coming, coming out of dormancy. They were starting to bloom. One specifically being the elf morphine, the Diamorpha smallii. This is a very cool plant species. How many people grow jade at home? You have a jade plant? This is in the same family, it's Crassulaceae, as jade. So they're small succulents. They live in these vernal pools or these little depression areas in rock outcrops. And they are winter annuals, so they go through an entire life cycle in one year. And that's another reason they're really sensitive to trampling, because they have to go through the entire process of reproducing, setting seed, and growing in one year. So they live a hard life on these alien landscapes of, of uh, limestone outcrops. Um, but yeah, they grow in these dense flowers or dense colonies. They flower in mass in the spring. And um, if I go to the yep, I have pictures of them flowering too. They they, they just started flowering. Um, they survive these really harsh and dry periods on these rock faces by being a succulent plant. So they retain moisture until it rains again. And then, um, like Matt mentioned earlier, the, the redness of those leaves is by a chemical produced by the plant called anthocyanins, which acts kind of as a natural sunscreen because, as you can imagine, these plants are out there in the blasting sun all day long. And so this helps them um, retain some of their water, protect their tissues from, from UV damage. But yeah, the flowers are just, if you've ever seen a jade flower, like they're identical, it's, it's really amazing. What, what pollinates them? You know, I don't actually know. I'm gonna guess, based on how small they are, probably small flies or midges, um, maybe beetles, I don't know, bees? bees? Probably some small bees also. <coughs> some plants have pretty specific pollinators, but sometimes they're pretty generalist as well. Um, we also walked down some of the floodplain trails down into the ravine, and there were some great plant species along the slopes. This one's Eupularia perfoliata, perfoliate bellflower, and I just included this one because I think the flower is just really beautiful, that dark yellow center. Um, they're very, very, very delicate um, in the way that they look. Um, another cool plant that I've really only seen in the apple etches is yellow root. Um, it's a ground cover. And they actually call it a shrub, but it doesn't really get much taller than a foot or even probably at max two, three feet. Um, but the leaves have a really lacy kind of carrot look 
Um, but the flowers are really unique. They're this bright maroon, kind of dark red. And um, the roots of the plant are bright yellow. That's their name. But um, they've been used for dyeing and basket making um, because of that color in the, in the stems. But they provide a really good ground cover. Um, I don't see them used a lot in plantings, but I'd like to see them more because, yeah, they can form a really nice low growing ground cover and provide really good habitat for birds, insects, and other animals. They do grow pretty strongly on the, the kind of sloping areas along stream beds and things like that, though. Uh, as you can see, April was very busy. We went to a lot of places. Um, my birthday hike was at Roy P. Whitaker Paint Rock Preserve, which I had never been to before. Really nice floodplain habitat. Of course, the Botanic Gardens is mind-blowing in April. I mean, the Azalea Trail is just phenomenal. Another trip to Prairie Glades Grove, there's a lot of great endemic species blooming at that spot in the spring. We did another cave. Not as fun as Tumbling Rock, but it was still a really cool spot. Um, I helped with the Chapman Mountain bird banding, which was really fun. Um, that's a Kentucky warbler there on the left. I can't, can't really see the next one, but um, some hikes at Green Mountain, Wade Mountain, and it took another paddle at a place called Kotaku Creek, which is, I think, part of wild, the wildlife refuge as well. But really, really nice um, outdoors time in April. Oops. So May gets a special mention because this is a place that I've been wanting to go to for a little while. Does anyone recognize it right off the bat, especially land trust folks? <laughs> so we had a full day, so we drove out to Cane Creek Canyon Nature Preserve, which is um, a new partnership for the Land Trust of Alabama. And man, it is spectacular. Um, this property is owned by Jim and Bay Lacefield. Jim is the author of that Alabama Rocks book that I mentioned earlier. Um, but this site is out near Tuscumbia, so maybe about an hour and a half west of here. And it's 700 acres of amazing mountainous habitat. Um, so it's got a lot of mountain streams, rocky glades, bluff habitat. Um, it's a nice mix of this like Appalachian and some familiar species to me as well. The first thing you see when you enter is this grassland kind of savanna type area, which is full of black needle grass, which is uh, a grass species I really love. It has these hair-like projections on the awns that, um, as the humidity changes, they can twist and untwist, and they drop off the plant and then actually um, twist and drill into the soil in order to kind of drill their seeds down into the soil. And they are super sharp. Uh, if you accidentally get one stuck in your knee, you will know. Um, but it's a really cool mechanism for the plant to disperse their seed, and they're just gorgeous, especially when you see them in a large planting like that. They're one of my favorite grass species. Um, and as you descend down into the canyon, you get these amazing views of, um, of course, the mountains and surrounding forested areas, but you also see mountain laurel, Calmia latifolia, which is pretty specific to these uh, acidic soils in Appalachia. And when they're flowering, they are spectacular because they bloom in mass. I did also see mock orange. I think this is inodorous, but I can't be positive. I don't, I don't quite remember. but. Um, these are commonly planted in plantings, but not always the native species, so this was really cool to see. Keep going further into the canyon, and you see these masses of Alabama azalea blooms, rhododendron alabamensi. It's not maybe as showy as some of the cultivated varieties, but man, like, I think it's, it's just as showy. I saw, give me a look. Like, how dare you talk about rhododendron alabamensi in that way? Um, but yeah, these displays were just huge, especially with the Calmia in the background. It's just a really cool site. And they have a really distinct, like, strong lemon floral scent. So the whole area is just filled with perfume, and there's bees and pollinators <laughs> buzzing all over the place. Really cool. Um, but yeah, they're not as color they're not <coughs> colorful, but they are unique and special in their own way. And a lot of times when you breed for color in cultivated plants, you take away that phenomenal scent. Um, that's something that's often retained with white flowers because they want to attract nocturnal pollinators sometimes, or sometimes just, just the way they are. They do have this little splash of yellow color on the upper uh, petal there, which I find very special. Are they native to Alabama? Yep, they're native to Alabama. Yep. And there are many of them at King Creek, like a, a truly uh, spectacular amount of rhododendron alphabets. 
Um, here, okay, so I put in a few pictures. Clearly, I really, really like this plant, um, but I thought this was a nice picture because you have this cool outcrop on the back. I, I don't know, maybe it's sandstone, but it's just got really neat patterning and then um, just the intense blooms of these flowers. I think we timed it just right. If we were maybe a week later, we may have missed a lot of the blooms. Another really unique species that there is there is Dodecathion frenchii, French's shooting star. Um, underneath some of these sandstone outcrops, um, they were kind of carpeting a couple areas, but they were not common at all. Um, it's much less common than the eastern shooting star, which is pretty common in the east and midwest, and is more like a prairie species. Um, but these really enjoy this damp microclimate that the sandstone provides, so it retains some moisture and it also creates a little cool microclimate and probably helps them sustain themselves through the really hot, <laughs> humid uh, summers of the southeast. Um, but it's pretty vulnerable wherever it's found, so if you ever come across it, just be really, really cautious with your hands and your feet. Um, it's hard to tell the two species apart, but you can see the flower has some <laughs> unique color and uh, patterning to it, which is really special. <coughs> And another great thing about Cane Creek is I think no matter what time of year you go there, you're going to see very cool um, just scenery because it's very structural. There's a lot of rock outcrops, a lot of um, unique features, and it's just a, a, a lot of evergreens, of course, too, so it's nice any time of year. We did also happen to see this little sweetie crossing the trail, so we uh, helped him across and going on his merry way. I think it is a male. Males typically have red eye rings, so it's a nice way to sometimes tell them apart. Uh, I could have shared a thousand photos from all of these places, I just want to, but I'm already like an hour in and I haven't even gotten to a uh, summer yet, so. Um, Levin's Gap was another great hike, um, it's just beautiful that time of year. Um, Oak Mountain was a new place for us to go to outside of Birmingham. Um, this is a stewardia, which is uh, a silky camellia, just flowers are spectacular. And uh, Keel Mountain, Lost Sink Falls was flowing and a really nice hike as well. We even drove up to Tennessee again and went to a place called Buggy Top, which I think is in Sherwood National Forest, but this spot was very cool. This cave, this rock face, if you go inside of it, which is quite tall, there's a river flowing out of it and you don't know where it comes from. It's very cool. <laughs> I, again, I know this is probably a common thing, but um, it was a very fun hike. <coughs> Um, all right, we've made it to June. We've only got a couple months left, so hopefully you guys are doing okay. Remember, if you have any questions, just let me know. Um, this is something that I had wanted to do since we moved here. I found out that there is one of the largest gray bat sanctuaries in America, right here in Northeast Alabama at Lake Gunnersville. So in that cave is where the bats roost. Um, thankfully, it's protected by a fence, but you can paddle to it. Um, if you head out to the dam and then you get in your canoe or kayak, you can paddle out to this area and um, wait until the bats emerge at dusk. So the gray bat is a real cutie. It is endemic to North America and they're cave specialists. So they roost only in caves and they also require them for not only winter hibernation, but they also have their maternal colonies in these caves. And so what that means is all the, all the ladies get together and they raise their babies in a big group, um, helps them be successful, and um, also helps them um, just in alerting them to any danger. But these bats are federally endangered, so any habitat where they exist is protected. And what I found really staggering when I read about them is that 95% of all gray bats hibernate in only 15 caves or less. So all of those bats are in 15 caves or less across the United States. So talk about something really special to North Alabama. This is a really unique thing. Um, so when these caves, uh, well actually let me see if I can play these. So there's a couple regular uh, videos and slow-mo videos. When you're right up next to the fence, you can look up and just see them all emerging in thousands of bats. Um, the two largest colonies exist in Mammoth Cave, with over 350,000 bats at Mammoth Cave, mm -hmm. and then over 60,000 bats documented at the Lake Guntersville uh, Great Bat Sanctuary. Oh, no, I'm having trouble. How many bats did you say, Sarah? So this Lake Guntersville um, Great Bat Cave is supposed to have around 60,000 bats oh, in, this, no. in this cave. But there also is um, the Sauda Cave National Wildlife Refuge very close by, so it's 
probably some are shared, maybe some are split between the two areas. But one big threat to them is damming of rivers. Uh, if, when you dam the river, it creates that lake and it floods those caves with water, and sometimes there's not enough room in there for that um, to, to go about their normal life. But of course, coming out of the cave, there's a lot of insects that hover around the water, so it's a really great feeding ground for them. And fortunately, the sky is still pretty dark in this region, so um, bats have a lot of hunting ground to tackle. <coughs> um, if you want to help gray bats, something great you can do is plant native plants. Don't use herbicides or pesticides. Um, they really require, like strictly require insects to survive. Um, but man, this, this was just a, a really life-changing experience for me that I really enjoyed. Um, I've never seen this many bats before. And I've done some emergence counts where you count bats as they come out of their roosts. And I would see like a trickle, like a handful <laughs> of bats. So this was just really, really cool. Um, so if you know someone with a boat or a canoe or a kayak, I definitely recommend doing this. I think May through September is generally the time they're there, and then they're hibernating this time of year. Um, really cool. And the bonus is then you get to paddle back in the night, you know, in the dark. And we had a really full moon that evening, so uh, I think this was taken with night sight on my phone or on Matt's phone or something. So surprisingly pretty bright paddle back and just a, a really nice quiet night on the water. Honorable mentions, some more um, hikes at Bankhead with a nice swimming hole day. Something I craved so badly in Illinois was having a swimming hole to go swim in, and uh, I was very excited to have many to choose from. Uh, our first trip up to Shoal Creek um, Nature Preserve, which was really fun. Uh, Goldsmith Schiffman, of course, Montesano, Bethel Springs, and I also <coughs> helped out on the Chapman Mountain Bio Blitz, which was really fun to go out with some buddies and count birds. All right, July. Uh, my favorite place to hike in town is Wade Mountain. Again, I'm a sucker for grasslands, so the Devil's Racetrack Trail is really cool, and it's different every time of year. Um, this area was probably a lot more widespread, but um, fortunately we have this little stronghold in uh, Madison County. There's some cool plants that grow there, like starry wild rosinweed, um, which is a silphium species, a little shorter than some of the ones we would see in Illinois in the Grand Prairie. Um, butterfly milkweed, which is obviously a very popular um, garden plant. I think it's one of the more commonly seen um, milkweeds. Monarchs depend on these as well. And rattlesnake masters, which are actually in the carrot family, which I think is pretty cool. They're a very um, charismatic species. And some of these were more familiar to me because they, they are in Illinois as well. But um, what I really find cool about this picture, besides this beautiful uh, lobelia, another species of lobelia, is that these two spiders are the same species, they're both crab spiders, but they're totally different colors. It's almost like this guy on the right did not get the memo about, <laughs> about casual day at work on Friday, but it's bright yellow, so I don't know, maybe it was on a yellow flower beforehand, it just hasn't adjusted its coloration since, but they do this for camouflage. So the one on the left is eating a bee um, who it has captured, who probably came to visit the flower unsuspectingly and got trapped by the crab spider, but everybody's got to eat, you know? Uh, this is green milkweed, Asclepias viridiflora, which is not super common, but also not very rare either. Um, one cool thing was seeing this uh, bumblebee do quite a lot of work on the uh, milkweed flowers, and if you look closely, you can see on its feet, or on its legs, pollinia, which are packets of pollen that specifically, like milkweeds and orchids, uh, they, they have this pollen dispersal method, where the pollinia, as the insect is on the, the flower, it, they sometimes get their legs stuck, and then the pollinia will stick to their legs or other parts of their body, like their face. And then, thankfully, the uh, insect carries that pollinia package away and makes sure that there's a sufficient amount of pollen carried to the next plant or flower. Um, sometimes, though, the, uh, the flower can be a little bit too snug, and sometimes insects will actually get their feet or their legs stuck in the flower. And if they're too weak or they're not very strong, they may have to leave their leg behind. So I just thought that was an interesting food for a thought. If you imagine like going somewhere and you're like, oh man, I gotta, guess I gotta leave my leg behind, or else I can't go my leg. So um, really just a fun, uh, a fun <coughs> Uh, Hartley skullcap, Scularia oveda is another mint that's uh, kind of prevalent in this area. 
Gonolobus tuberosus, or angle pod, is a member of the milkweed family, so um, to, monarchs can use that as well. And then we actually have a false aloe, manfreda, which is an agave. We have a native agave that grows in our grasslands, which is pretty cool too. They really like the rocky soils and the uh, outcrop areas. Some honorable mentions for July. Uh, Green Mountain. We also took a trip down to Hurricane Creek, which is in Aniston? I might be wrong, um, but it's south of here a little bit. Um, Beaver Dam Boardwalk was pretty dry that time of year, um, and then some more great hikes at Lake Gunnersville. Um, they have some really nice trails and really cool plants um, that I think are undersold. It's a really cool spot to hike. Of course, Wolves and the Shipmen, and um, actually took a trip up to Savage Gulf, which is a really beautiful area in Tennessee. Uh, this outcrop in particular had a lot of liatris microcephala growing along the edge. Very beautiful purple flower. Um, just a really nice spot. Okay, we're going to wrap up the year with August. Uh, August of this year. So August is um, a really great month too. Again, great for uh, grasslands and prairies. So we decided to go out to Prairie Glades Grove again, as you can tell it's one of my my uh, particular spots in the region. But this plant is kind of common throughout most of the land trust preserves and within this area. This is Carolina buckthorn. And coming from the north, the only buckthorn I was familiar with is a very invasive one from Europe. So this is a fantastic native species that is um, a nice understory plant. But this spot is just really cool and unique. I, I love the way it looks. There's a lot of these old cedars. Some of them are falling down. Some of them are stunted in their growth. So they have really unique forms and shapes. And um, then you have these open areas, again, of that mosaic where you have treed boundaries, open grassland spots, and it's kind of patchy. So there's a lot of nooks and crannies you can explore. And some of the neat plants we saw there in the summer, as opposed to it over the fall, um, one that I really love is frock pink or femoranthus. And the name kind of tells you a little bit about it. It's ephemeral. It's, it only blooms for a couple hours a day during the summer. And each bloom only lasts one day. And the first time I saw one of these um, was in South Carolina, and we walked by it, didn't notice it, and came back at around 5 o'clock, and on the dot, it was blooming. So um, it's only about the size of my thumb, so it's very precious, but um, they grow in these, these rock scree kind of areas, these rock piles um, in these glade and limestone glade areas. And then um, a narrow leaf vervain with a very cute little skipper butterfly uh, visiting. And a really neat aster called frostweed, um, again, a more southern species that was a, a bit new to me, but a uh, wonderful species nonetheless. And I highlighted this helium again because you can kind of tell it's different from the other one, maybe not. The, the petals are a little wider, they're more lobed, and the um, leaves are kind of grass-shaped. So um, I thought it was a little bit different. It's probably a different species, there's a few. But the, the biggest, most special thing about it is, do you notice anything strange about this flower on the right? It's got this weird mass on top. Mm -hmm. Does anyone know what it is? It is an insect. It is a camouflage looper caterpillar. So camouflage looper is a type of butterfly. And it's a beautiful type of butterfly. Bright green with these kind of spearmint colors. And that little caterpillar goes around from plant to plant, and it says, i got to hide myself. I don't want to get eaten by any birds or other animals, so I'm going to pluck off pieces of this plant and stick them to my body. <laughs> Which is a really effective way of hiding yourself, I suppose. I mean, I can obviously see that there's something wrong with this plant, but I don't quite know what at first, right? So he's doing a pretty good job. Um, but I wanted to highlight this because I think it's just a really fun... When you look up close at plants, this is the kind of stuff you see. Right? You see all the unique, cool insect interactions, all of the uh, different things that de depend on these plants. Which you call the butterfly again? Everyone? It's called a camouflage looper. Um, I hope that's the right species, but there may be more than one in different areas of the country. I don't know, but uh, I feel like I've seen those moths, or butterflies before. So. Is it a moth or a butterfly? Now I'm guessing myself. If you Google it, you'll, you'll probably find out. <laughs> Um, this plant was the coolest thing we saw at Prairie Glades Grove, in my opinion. This is an areogonum, which are um, buckwheats, and it's called an umbrella plant, plant because if you can see in the middle picture, it's quite tall, and then it has this big arching bloom. 
Um, and each of those stems has quite a lot of small blooms on them. It is a critically imperiled plant. It's not listed or protected, but it is critically imperiled. And it's partially because these glade habitats are so rare. So you don't see these uh, that commonly. And this was the only plant we saw at this site in bloom. Um, so I don't know if they need to outcross to be able to set seed, but as you can imagine, being the only last remaining plant in your glade habitat must be pretty tough. Um, but what's even crazier about these plants is that they're monocarpic. So they normally exist as a small, green, regular looking plant as a rosette on the ground. And then they produce one bloom and then they die. So they have one chance to get it right, right? Um, this plant exists in only two counties of Alabama and it does also exist in, um, or it's distributed through Kentucky and Tennessee. But um, because Alabama doesn't offer state level protections for plant species, um, it likely will be hard to preserve the species in the future unless they, they begin to do that. Um, this, again, was the only individual we saw, but fortunately this guy was getting pollinated um, by this very sweet juniper hair streak. Um, this is a butterfly you can see. Well, it's not. Ooh, I'll restart it again, maybe just test a load. But on the tips of the ends of their wings, they have these little um, kind of like appendages that actually move, which I find really neat. I don't know the mechanism behind it. I just I noticed it when I was watching this video. I thought it was really cool. Oh, I'll play that video again. Just so you guys can see the butterfly in motion. Unless it doesn't want to play, and then I guess. There we go. So it does offer a pretty nice nectar resource, resource for different insects and pollinators. Um, but yeah, these habitats are pretty few and far between. You know, there's a lot of cattle grazing in the region, which knocks out a lot of these plants, even though it maintains a similar habitat structure. Um, you know, of course, trees and woody exclusion, um, not a lot of fire, so fire suppression is a big, a big reason for the declines in these areas. And development, you know, hence will growing a lot. Um, and as we keep creeping out into different areas, these are the types of habitats that we want to really protect, not just our forests, but our grasslands too. So, um, honorable mentions for August, Blevins Gap. Um, Big Spring Park. It's really cool. Thanks for you guys for showing it to us. We were like, hey, we didn't know this even existed. And we were downtown looking at chimneys, chimney swifts. And I was like, whoa, there's like a mossy, rocky spring underneath the city hall. This is cool. Um, Chapman Mountain, that's a, a meat cricket that I've never seen before. Uh, Blevins Gap, I took a hike along Black Warrior Creek when I was coming back from the Birmingham airport and saw this really neat slug caterpillar that I'd never seen before. And of course, some nice hikes at Montesano as well. Um, so again, it was extremely challenging for me to pare this down. I think I turned like an hour talk into an hour and a half talk, so I appreciate you all being very patient with me. But um, this is just an example of what my Google map looks like, my saved map. Um, the blue spots are not necessarily all places that I've been, but um, some of them are aspirational as well. But as you can see, there's quite a lot of density of natural areas to explore just in the Huntsville region. And I would say that everything in this map range is within a two hour drive. So um, hopefully you're feeling inspired to go out and explore some new places. These are some of the online resources that I really like for learning about our local plants and animals. Outdoor Alabama specifically has a very cool section all about um, the different wildlife, different species, bats, birds, you name it. And Alabama Plant Atlas um, is of course the place that I, I go for most of my plant needs. Um, but there's a lot of great information there. Um, so with that, if you want to keep in touch, I, I have my card. You can follow me on Instagram or, or get in touch through my website. And um, these are just a sample of some of the photos you'd see if you follow me on Instagram. And um, yeah, thank you for coming to my talk. I was kind of expecting to see Bibb County in May with the Cahaba lilies. Did you get there? I have not gotten there yet. So um, one of the, I would say, fortunate and also unfortunate caveats of my job is I do quite a lot of travel for field work, and sometimes I have to go for a long time. So in May, um, which is peak Cahaba lily time, I was in Texas for almost the entire month. I was done for three weeks. So when I came back, it was one of those things that I just really wanted to do, but when you're a weekend warrior and you try to get out for the weekends, it's tough to, to cram it all in. So 
Um, I've heard about it. I've also heard that there's synchronous fireflies potentially in that area. So something I really want to do is, is go down there. I have seen Big County Glades in a very tiny, condensed time, um, just on a very short walk. I saw some cool species, but I haven't gotten out there to do much about knife yet. Are the Cahaga lilies really as rare? I mean, is that really the only place they exist, or is it just that's where they found them and there's actually no others? Other people may know more than they're me. They're very much that rare. So the Cahaba lily, yeah. uh, it doesn't grow like the other species in that group. It needs to be wedged in a rock in a fast moving clear stream, and that's really the yeah. only place that they can exist. Mm -hmm. There's ones that look exactly like yeah. it, so when they call it, I have a Cahaba lily, you know, you have a spider lily. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> the yeah. are truly yeah. special down there. Yeah. yeah, there's a lot of lilies throughout the southeast that are, again, spider lilies, very, very similar. Um, but Sometimes there's these slight variations in plants, right, that make them specific to different types of habitats, and that's one perfect example. What did your flags on the map mean? Oh, so, oh, right, so, um, well, it's very loose, fast and loose. Uh, <laughs> let's just say, the blue are typically, if they're in a, a list I have called hiking spots, um, mm -hmm. but also there's, um, like kayak put in in there and things like that too. The green are, I believe, like want to go places, like places I haven't yet gone, but I, I keep them on the map because, you know, say you wake up on a Saturday and you're like, wow, I'm up early. What do I want to do today? I can always open my saved Google map that I have mm -hmm. and I can see, all right, I'm willing to drive an hour and a half today. Where can I get to? And um, that's part of the reason we get to see some pretty cool places is because I may look around and find a place, like for example, I don't know what that is in Jasper, but there's something in Jasper that I want to go see. And so I have a flag, and then so a day when I have the time, I can pull it up and decide if I um, want to get there. So like for example, I haven't been to Talladega yet, yes. I would love to, but um, you know that's an area on my map that if I have the time, I can get to. I don't know what the heart is though. <laughs> it's like a tail yeah, it must be something real special. <laughs> <laughs> That's your home. No, I wish. It's not. Yeah. Yeah, I'm curious now, but yeah, you can see there's some areas up in Tennessee too. I, I haven't been up to Chattanooga, but that's a want to go place. I think the one up in the northeast corner of Georgia there is that cave, Howard's um, waterfall cave. So yeah, but this is just a nice thing to have, you know. I, I appreciate Google Maps for that, that you can save and store some of your favorite places into different lists. So, thanks. Any other questions? Cool. Yeah. What do you use for your photos? It's really awesome. Oh, thank you. So, I had this, these are all pretty much all taken with a Google Pixel camera phone. Um, and not a new one either, like a fairly uh, couple years old version. I actually. It doesn't work as a phone anymore, but I kept it. I kept it for the camera because it takes such great pictures that um, I I got a new phone and then now when I go out hiking, it's actually kind of nice because I can put my other phone in my pocket and no one bothers me and no one's calling me and I don't pay attention to it and I can just be kind of off the grid taking photos with my my pixel camera. So yeah, surprisingly, all taken on a cell phone, which is. <laughs> Yeah, I would say almost all of them. Did you happen to go to Cypress Creek in Florence? No, I haven't. I'm dying to get out to Muscle Shoals, Florence area. It's yeah. incredibly beautiful. I heard there's a restaurant called some sort of saloon, and it's in a cave. A restaurant? <laughs> yeah! It's on the list, guys. It's definitely that green spot that says, want to go. You've been pretty busy, though. This is good. Yeah, I mean, I think there is. I think a lot of people are like, how? And I'm like, I don't know. I just, just go. I just go. Like, you know, we really um, do like Super Saturday and spend Saturday usually exploring somewhere and then do the rest of life stuff on Sundays. And um, the great thing is, you know, like when the pandemic hit and stuff, you can go outside. It's a good time. And, and when, you're, when you love nature and the outdoors, um, you know, there's really no limit to the, the things you can find to do. It's all free for the most part, um, besides gas, of course, which is not very cheap these days. But um, yeah, I, I mean, I think that it's all very attainable if you're you know, a morning person, you get up, get out the door. It's a little tougher this time of year with the sun setting a little early, but it can definitely be done. Yes? 
So what was, what's the most exciting or most awesome thing that you have found about this area when, after being here for a year? That's tough because I feel like the plant diversity is, of course, very exciting. Um, the fact that I can still find new things all the time is, is really fun and exciting. Um, I also think that coming to a place that has a lot of rivers, streams, waterfalls, caves is really unique. Again, my time in New York and Illinois, they're very different places, um, at least places I live. And I remember you know, certain things that were my favorite things about those and um, also my least favorites. You know, like I said, living in Illinois, we didn't have a lot of opportunities for kayaking and canoeing and being out near the water. You know? Certainly not a lot of caves. So the caves were the caves are definitely um, pretty neat, but I I'm definitely scared of them. I'm still kind of scared of them, um, but I, I it's worth doing. It's worth trying out. But the, the, like I said, the most exciting thing to me is that there's still so much to explore. And Alabama is similar to some other states. I mean, Illinois is probably similar in distance from top to bottom. And the range of habitats you can see throughout the state um, is also part of why it's so diverse. But, um, you know, this is just the north portion, so um, getting down to different habitats is very exciting. All right, so thank you so much for being here. Y'all have a good evening, and we'll see you next time. Thanks.